hi, welcome. Uh, and yes, as was mentioned, welcome. This is the, uh, the show and tell portion of the program. Uh, I'm gonna go pretty quick here, because as you know, we are already running a little bit behind, but um, this is the result of our call for failures. And not everything that you will see today is actually a failure, but everything does bring with it a lesson, so pay close attention. Um, and I would like to bring up to the stage, first of all, Orr Weiss from Brookout, uh, with a tale of high stakes, observability in the military. Speaking loud enough. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Awesome. So as, I'm, as I said, my name is Or Weiss. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rookout. We're also in the observability space. Um, my background starts in the IDF and the Intelligence Corps. I was a lieutenant there. And I'm going to share with you a war story about the, a case where the stacks were high and so were the stakes. Um, so going a couple years back, more than a couple years, um, I was a young officer in the Intelligence Corps, and I was really naive. You can see from this picture here, I was too enthusiastic about what's going on. And I was uh, set in charge to work in a system that was supposed to be deployed in the field and handle cases where we, I won't go into too much detail, uh, but we were supposed to build a system that would receive hard drives, analyze them, and uh, produce results. And the uh, interesting part was, that we only got to have five deployments. Um, because every time you reach into the field, there's a lot of risk. Um, and so we only had those fives. And we have very little concrete information on what we actually get in production. We know we get, get hard drives. We don't really know how they're going to look, what file systems they have. And we needed to be able to handle all of that. And in addition, on top of that all, we knew that if, that if we fail, People will die. It's often the case with the military, and it's the case here, so no sweat. Um, so we did a first uh, solution. We deployed it to the field, and it failed utterly. It failed in such a way that we didn't even understand what part was failing. We, de we did have some indications that the parts that were failing were not even within our code. So we had a huge challenge here. And we saw a giant gap between what we were planning as we were building the product and what we were finally seeing in production. And we had to bridge that gap. We had to do it quickly and knowing that we have to iterate because we don't know exactly what to look. But also, we don't have a lot of chances for iteration. We've got only four more times. So again, high stakes. Um, so we were diving into it, and we were trying to understand where actually our problem is. So first thing, first thing we did was look at our stack. And we understood that the area space, the space where the problem is, is huge. You can see here, I built a small uh, demonstration of all the different components that the stack that we're working with was including. So we have hardware that's changing because we get different hard drives. We had an operating system that, while not necessarily changing, has a lot of different components that we don't have full control of. Obviously, we have the, the box itself, the server and the framework that we were using. We've got the build and deployment system that, was, that we used to deploy to the field with all the weird aspects that that had. And obviously, the runtime, the architecture, and finally, our own code. So this is a huge haystack. And we need to look within it and try to figure out which part of it is actually failing. And when and we, when we actually know that the part that we usually suspect, our own application, isn't actually that part. On top of that, the data space itself is also huge. What you're seeing here is a snapshot of the master boot record of a FAT32 partition table. Um, and you, basically with that, you have a lot of variants. You have a lot of different components in the partition. And every element with that can really change the way the operating system is reacting to the data. So we've got a lot of drives constantly loading into the system. And each of them has uh, a master boot record and obviously the entire other partition. And we need to figure out within the stack, in correlation to this piles of data that is very minute, we need to figure out which specific point is the point that's causing our failure and how we can fix it to eventually get to the successful state that we need. 
Um, so we went into investigating, and with, with that understanding that we don't have a lot of iterations, we said, okay, we need to pinpoint that area that will contain our data. So we said, okay, we'll need to have a lot of data on what's going on here. And uh, the main challenge was going from that mindset of what we've, we were developing and what we'll actually get in production. So we had to be creative and we need to find a way to observe things in a, in a smart and relative way that correlates to our uh, limited iteration count. What we ended up doing was having statistical snapshots on those different parts in the partition table and accumulating as many of those as we can in correlation to the failures that we had. What we end up doing with that data is taking it back home and doing some replication, trying to uh, recreate those partition tables that were causing those crashes. And after a lot of attempts and a lot of mixing and matchings from those statistical partition table parts that we were getting, we we're basically building uh, Frankenstein monsters over there, uh, we finally got to the point that it was crashing in a similar way to that it was crashing in production, in the field. And we were literally screaming there, yay, it's crashing! Um, and w the result was, what we were seeing was a blue screen. Windows, the operating system that was running our solution, was crashing. And uh, we also saw which driver, which component was uh, responsible for the crash. And in which case that was. Um, and actually, the, in, to try to show you in the code, sorry, in the data what was causing the problem, is you see that number two in the second row, if that number is three or higher, the application crash crashes. Uh, the, sorry, the entire operating system crashes in uh, older versions of Windows. Not that old, uh, but still. Um, that bug was actually a vulnerability within Windows that became publicly known only five years later, called now CVE 2014 uh, 4115. Uh, it was a bug in how Windows loads partition tables and how it parses uh, FAT32 file systems. Um, basically, it was expecting to always get two FAT tables, and if it was getting more of them, it would, the system would often crash. It also had a statistical element to that. Um, so wh what did we learn here? We learned that in some cases, there's a huge gap in the mindset between what you think you're gonna face when you're building software and what you actually see in production. And that gap can be in areas that you don't even think about. It could be in a very separate, uh, elusive component that you don't really know is going to affect your, where your code runs. We learned that we need to plan for iterations. Uh, you can't always get all the data you need on the first time. I didn't mention it, it took us uh, two more iterations to actually get the amount of data we needed. Um, and while I'm talking about rather old systems here, like actual physical servers, I think that when you're working with microservices or serverless or, or other modern ar architecture, the problem actually becomes uh, more, uh, uh, more difficult or more uh, acute uh, because the problem space actually increases. It's not just one server. You have thousands of those stacks sc uh, scattered around and communicating asynchronously. Um, so iteration here is key to own in on what you want to do and how we build those iterations and how we focus on them in an agile fashion is really the key to figuring out how to face those challenges. And when we do those iterations, we often need to think about how we can reduce risk, which was obviously critical here but it's critical everywhere, everywhere else. How we reduce friction in the way we deploy it to production, and in the end, how we find the right balance to work between what we're expecting to see in production and the way we want our code to behave. Um, from that, those understanding, uh, actually the company I'm working on now, Rookout, uh, came to be, and uh, you're welcome to check it out. And, uh, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions for Or, feel free to chat with him after.
Uh, you're more than welcome to come and ask me other questions. Don't ask me what the technology or the operation was. I, you, I can tell you, but I'll have to kill you. So. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, next up, we have Rachel Fong <laughs> from Honeycomb, who's clearly ready to be up here. <laughs> Run! The one who's, she's going to talk to us about how observability is sometimes means the best choice is to do nothing. Uh, hey, I'm Arfong, and I work at Honeycomb. I'm a platform-ish engineer. Uh, I wrote this talk yesterday, so I really hope you like it. <laughs> Um, this is a story about using observability to decide when it actually pays off to do nothing at all. Um, so a little bit of background context. Honeycomb, uh, we use a custom data store that we've built, and we call it Retriever. Um, it's distributed and it's column-oriented. This helps us for a number of reasons. If you're curious why we built a custom data store, that's a super long explanation, so check out the link in that slide. Um, and we have multiple retriever replicas which are syncing all the time for fault tolerance reasons. So um, recently we were looking at retriever and it's storing information sort of redundantly. Um, some people on the platform team noticed that there was an enormous potential to save uh, a lot of storage. And so I rewrote the var string storage format in itself this was a pretty small one-day change. Um, but the thing is that when you're making a super low-level change to your custom streaming ingest distributed data store, um, a super tiny change can result in extremely complex anomalies and failure cases. And these all have parameters that you can't simulate out of production. A lot of them are based on external behavior. Um, so I had to re-architect it so that we had no risk of customer data loss, essentially. The changes had to be fully reversible. They had to be backwards compatible and testable in production. Um, this is really interesting, so I wish I could talk about it more, but we don't have time. <laughs> so in order to make the read and write path fully reversible and testable in production, I was running the legacy encoding scheme sort of alongside the new compact encoding scheme so that um, both representations of the data, the legacy scheme and the old scheme, existed in production at the same time. And um, the thing was that I was not actually deleting them yet. This helped us catch a lot of production bugs without risking customer data loss. So I would see uh, prod bugs come up that normally would have been really alarming, but because I was keeping both schemes side by side, I was able to fix them. Um, so of course, if we're not deleting the legacy data file, we're not actually reaping any cost savings at all from compression. That was the next step. So up to this point, uh, I managed to maintain our fault tolerance guarantees. Um, however, instances are dying and bootstrapping all the time, and usually we can recover an instance. Uh, we're backed by Apache Kafka, which gives us certain fault tolerance guarantees. But there's a certain bootstrap case where we have to fall back to this sort of barbaric multi-stage rsync to synchronize our data replicas. And the whole team was super stumped about this. I found myself reading rsync documentation, and that's when I knew I'd gone down a really deep hole, and <laughs> I needed to step back and kind of take a look at the bigger picture. Um, after brainstorming, we kind of came up with these two equally really terrible solutions to our rsync problem. Uh, we kind of agreed that neither of these was a good idea at all. And so we originally thought that this replica syncing edge case was happening all the time because retriever nodes are bootstrapping, they're crashing and coming back up all the time, and usually it's not a big deal because we have fault tolerance. Um, but then I slowly realized that no one on the team actually knew the quantitative answer to how often this replica syncing case occurred. We knew that it did happen. People would say, there's an rsync in our bootstrapping process, but no one actually knew how often it was happening. And so when I used Honeycomb to find out, I found out it was only happening two or three times a month. Um, so we were frequently right about say, the theoretical limits of the system behavior. We knew that rsync could happen all the time. But using observability, we were able to find out that it actually only represented a fraction of a percent of cumulative uptime. And so since the original point of the project was to improve storage, 
and compression was improving storage by 55% anyway, I realized we can totally ignore this case. We're not Google. We don't care about a fraction of a percent. Um, and so I had originally gotten stuck on this rsync problem because uh, I had the mindset that I had to engineer a solution for this problem. But in reality, there was a third completely different option which satisfied all of my project goals was to just skip the compression step in this really bad case that was difficult to engineer your way out of. Um, and this turned out to be a really great trade. Basically, we bypassed a few hundred megabytes of compression, and we got peace of mind about fault tolerance, and I was able to roll out this project. Yay, so I safely flipped the deletion flag. Here's a graph of our usage dropping by 55%, or our uh, storage usage. And I just want to thank everyone at Honeycomb, uh, platform engineers, product engineers, biz people, for helping me ship this project. Next, we have Mike Atkins from Launch Darkly coming up to talk about how observability means, yeah, it's probably always the network. Yeah. Okay, he's going to switch it next time. And then oh, okay. Up. Oh, and does this work? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was making a mistake earlier. So. Oh, I see. All right, great. Um, so, my name's Mike. I work at Launch Darkly, and uh, we provide a service that lets people put feature flags in their application. And sometimes what they want to do is use that feature flag to turn off something that is working very poorly, maybe. So we need to be able to serve flag updates very quickly. So we have a streaming API that does that. Um, and recently, we tried to, or we did, make an improvement in our streaming protocol um, that would allow updates to propagate more quickly in some scenarios. Uh, but when we tried that, um, initially, we got a chart like this, which showed that our uh, 99 percentile uh, stream initialization times like, were now very high, like oh, about a second. Uh, and we have enough connections where that's quite problematic. Um, so we also had this chart that was about the proxied request time in our stream initialization. So part of our stream initialization is to call another service. And we saw this chart. And it looked very similar in shape and, t and magnitude to our uh, uh, chart of increased latencies. So we're like, OK, great. That's it. Like, it's the, uh, that's the problem. It's that service. We'll like, tune that. We'll be good. But uh, we were like, well, maybe we should check that before we like, start diving into that. So we used a uh, distributed tracing tool to see that even on these uh, scenarios where we spent like two seconds uh, doing this HTTP request. Uh, the other service said it only it took two milliseconds. Uh, so it obviously wasn't that other service. Um, but that's OK. It probably was you know, some misconfiguration in one of our load, balances, load balancers or like some weird EC2 setting we just need to look at. So we're like, great, we'll just do that. Uh, and we started doing that for a while. And then eventually we got to the point where we we're like, OK, like, now I'm like reading about how the kernel like queues stuff before it sends it to my process. Like, I, I think it could be something else. So uh, we actually kind of like went back to that trace. And we, for some reason, had the foresight to like do a TCP dump of that. Uh, and then we just like looked through the TCP dump log. Uh, luckily, we could use that like trace ID to find the relevant uh, request. And we could see that basically, you know, the, the computer said that it got the request back in two milliseconds. Like, it didn't take two seconds to get the response for its request. Uh, so at that point, we were like, oh, well, actually, it's probably just like, you know, something that we can easily control, like, in our program. So then we opened up, like, the Go tracing tool. Uh, and uh, it has this kind of complicated plot, but. I've kind of highlighted the thing that was interesting was like, oh, we saw this like huge queue of Go routines that had backed up a lot. And that seemed to happen when the garbage collector was running. Uh, and then, uh, we, then that basically means that our CPU wasn't able to keep 
up with the workload we were throwing at it for like this one second. Uh, and that is why everything queued up. But the thing is, like we had like CPU charts and it said like, you know, you're like 10% CPU usage, everything's fine. But our uh, CPU chart is only at one minute resolution. So, you know, even though it was fine for, you know, 59 seconds of that minute, there was one second where it was at 100% and causing latency for these requests. Um, so, if you ever are in a scenario where latency is your problem, it might be a CPU issue, not necessarily a network problem. Still tall. <laughs> Sorry, I'll leave it low. Uh, next up, we have Ilika Mahajan from 3Scan, and she is going to talk about the fact that the hardware software boundary also needs observability. We're going to plug her in here in just a sec. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to take you a different direction now, and we're going to talk about debugging across hardware and software boundaries. Uh, or because I played way too many board games, apparently I just have to do that. Apparently, uh, since I played too many board games, who killed our image quality? Uh, so a kind of detective game here. Uh, first, quickly, what does 3Scan do? So we build robotic microscopes that serially dissection tissue, uh, and then we render that, de uh, that data in 3D for analysis, so kind of like and this is why I had to plug my laptop in. I wanted to give you guys kind of a visual of what that looks like. So this is uh, what our data set will look like at the end of the day. Uh, this is vascularization of a mouse brain. Um, and so, all right, what kind of mystery are we solving today? So we're integrating a new camera into our machine. And while doing so, we started seeing some really undesired image artifacts, which uh, is really important when your entire job of the company is to image data sets of tissue, especially. Uh, so we uh, started seeing this like rainbow artifact that you can see on the left picture, uh, which we called rainbow barf. And on the right one, we had a test image being printed out from the camera. And it was uh, firing at wrong time, so the, the line shouldn't be there. It should be one clear image. And so we were seeing weird things that the camera was doing. And then because all the cameras decided to rebel at once, another camera we were seeing weird squishing and stretching of the imagery. So uh, the observation here is not a graph, but it's actually just literally our images. Um, okay, so I'm going to quickly run through the suspects just to give you an idea of how many components are at play here. So, like, so many things could be going wrong in hardware land that you don't have to deal with in software land. One of them being the wiring, like how your components are wired together. Like, we could have crossed two wires. There could be a grounding issue somewhere. And so this one debugging is literally me sitting with a multimeter being like, did I connect this wire to the right pin here? Uh, another problem could potentially be uh, how we're interpreting signals that come off of the stage that holds the sample. Uh, so that is a moving component um, that moves the tissue sample, scrapes it against our knife, and we image at the same time. And so we get a lot of data from the stage about uh, how fast it's moving and what direction it's moving in, and that's synchronized with the camera telling the camera how fast to fire. Uh, there's a frame grabber in between that pulls a data stream, uh, but this is the component with which we tell uh, the camera what settings to be operating with. So it was possible that uh, the settings just weren't making it through all the way to the, either the frame grabber or the camera, or that the settings themselves were just wrong. So there's like, a, I have these configuration files that are just rows and rows of different uh, parameters that you have to set, and uh, they just might have been set wrong. Um, so, how do we actually like go about and like m try and figure out which of the suspects uh, could be the problem here? Um, and so, I kind of want to break this down into smaller components. But basically, like the first step is 
uh, have a mock for your systems, uh, for, the, for the driver's APIs, and then unit test your mock. Um, the mock is like how you expect the device to be behaving, and the test is the contract uh, for how the behavior of the mock. Um, and you want to be thorough. You want to model out all your error cases and everything, uh, so and make it behave at, with real time as you would expect your device in real time to behave. Then you want to abstract away. So you want an interface layer that's uh, between your calling code and this mock, and you're going to test against that interface. Uh, the interface between the mock and the calling code is the promise that the mock and the device are equivalent interface. Uh, are equivalent behind the interface. And then we can uh, switch out in real time instead of being against the mock in testing, in, in production we're against the real device. Uh, the mock used in integration, in the integration surface, um, allows us to also uh, continuously test in CI, which means that we can be actively developing at all times. Uh, and then we're gonna, then unit test our testing suite against the real device, uh, which is more like an integration test than a unit test. Unit testing the device would be more like hooking up your oscilloscopes and like shoving your stage around just to see that the signals are coming out clean. Um, so there's a lot of different segments of um, testing avenues that you have to take in order to bisect the problem. Uh, so who was actually the cause of the, the squishing and stretching problem? It was uh, my fault for misconfiguring the camera uh, so that the camera was ignoring trigger instructions from the stage and instead was using an uh, internal line rate. So that created an, a discrepancy between how fast the stage was moving and how fast the camera was triggering. Uh, and the rainbow artifacts, the problem was, uh, so never trust your vendors is like a good rule of thumb. They'll write a lot of things, they'll make you a lot of promises, uh, but the camera firmware and the output cable which they told us to use didn't actually work together to move the data at the frame rate that we expected. So we needed either a different type of cable or they were like, oh no, you shouldn't need a different type of cable. Here's a beta version of the firmware, you can install this, and the beta version still hasn't been released, so we're just using different firmware than what they've released to the public. But, uh, so, there we have it, firmware. <laughs> Just drop it. Thank you very much. Next up on the stage, Jonathan Madani from Cisco, who is going to tell us that interns also need observability. <laughs> and I just wait until the slides come up because he's got to switch off. Yeah, I, well, I tried. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, that's loud. My name is Jonathan. I am a fourth year at University of British Columbia uh, up north in Vancouver. And this summer, I'm an intern at Cisco. And specifically, I'm on the monitoring metrics and logging team. And so um, just like the intern I am, I like to create a lot of bugs for my team. And so recently, um, our system, the product we're working on is like a tooling service of a sort where a user can come to us. They can request a third-party software as a service, and using our CLI API, we'll go make it for them. Very simple stuff. The only promise we have is you can only make one resource at a time, or in period. You can't make two, you can't make five, just straight up one. Um, later, we realized that people want to make more than one, so we're like, you know what? We hear you. We'll, make you, we'll let you make as, limit, as many as you want, um, but you need to be like a VIP user, almost, so we'll give you that access. Um, so how this all works out is they'll make a request, we'll verify that they think they are who we think we are, and we'll get their features and we'll go make it for them. Um, so we rolled this out and suddenly all the VIP users that we were granting were complaining that they were getting unauth errors and we're like, that's interesting. Let's go look at our observability tools, like our tracing systems and all that good stuff. And we saw that badly structured token error failed to parse tokens. So we're like, okay, this is definitely a 401 error. 
let's go, let's go make sure what's going on. But we, we looked into our logs, our back end, and we're like, no, no, we're, we're authenticating. They're the right people. Um, so what's going on? From there, we tried to recreate the issue ourselves, and we couldn't do it. So we're like, now we're actually lost. OK. Um, and from there, we started tracking the tracker. So we decided, you know what? Observability tools can only go so far. This seems like there's like a deeper issue underlying here. We took to our um, customers and were like, can you go refresh your token? All this good stuff. And nothing was happening. And from there, we started just go through the process ourselves. We're like, OK, when someone makes a request, what happens? We authenticate. Are we authenticating properly? And we realized soon enough that we were caching their tokens. And we're like, OK, we're caching them. Are we, uh, are we updating their cache? And you bet. We weren't. <laughs> so um, we were trying to validate with using an expired token to make more than make VIP requests. And so these were our VIP errors were coming from. Um, and after that, we were bubbling these 401 errors straight back to our clients. Obviously, this is like a server side error. This is like on our fault. And so we should have been bubbling like a 500, so we know like this is our fault. And none of this was being triggered by our alarms because. A 401 error during highly development stage is like, you know, you can kind of expect that. And so it wasn't tripping any alarms. Um, and so we had all these tools in place, but they weren't helping us. This is what we learned that, you know, even though that you have all these tools in place and you um, try your best, that tools can only help you go so far. At some point, you have to rely on your code structure and you're really hoping that it works as what you expect. And so that's where I'm really trying to hammer that down the point that context really turns unknown unknowns where you don't know what you don't know um, into stuff where you're like, I kind of have an idea of what could go wrong. Um, I think, yeah, that really is my point here. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Strong enough to put it back. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks very much. And last up on the stage for this segment, last failure, is Nitsan Shapir from Epsigon, who's going to talk about observability and the shock of an AWS bill. And yeah, let's start. I yeah, you, can, you can take it. And then, uh, yeah, wait till it And how do I? Um, this is the green oh, thing. Okay, yeah. oh, yeah. Now you're ready. Hello. I'm Nitsan from Epsigon. Um, I'm going to talk about something that happened to us as uh, AWS Lambda users, uh, which proves that like scalability is something that doesn't happen from itself, and you can't assume that your system is very scalable, and how it can also be affected uh, in the AWS bill that you're getting. So, so I'm a, an engineer in my background. Um, I was in the cybersecurity unit in the Israeli intelligence for a long time, so I did some reverse engineering, stuff like this. And today I'm in Epsagon for the last year. So what we do, and it's uh, important to understand because this is about our backend, uh, so we do distributed tracing and visualization for serverless. So we automatically trace and discover all the services and enable the users to quickly troubleshoot issues and also estimate their costs and their functions. And we are also serverless in our backend, which means that we can use our system on our own backend, which is pretty cool. And it also actually helped us in this example. So uh, some of the things we do is we actually scan uh, functions for the account of the user to tell different things about the function, such as invocations, errors, timeouts, and also the cost of the function. So this thing at first seems quite simple. So why not just scan the functions in a very simple way and provide information? Because we are a startup. We just started. We want to deploy quickly into production. So we just did something that is quite simple. We said, OK, let's uh, just invoke a Lambda function every five minutes. It will scan uh, all the customers' accounts and, uh, and spawn new function for every one of the customers' functions. So this means that you can basically do it very scalable, very easily. So if the customer has like 100 functions, 500, 1,000, it's OK. The Lambda can handle very high concurrency, and everything will be OK. And then we saved it a very, in a very smart way to a RDS database, which 
uh, is not as scalable as we found out, but at first it worked pretty nicely. Like it just worked, all the functions, was, functions were scanned, and it worked. And then at some point, well, <laughs> I looked at our dashboard on our own backend, and I actually saw that like we have like a monthly estimation cost. So in case the function starts to work very, uh, <laughs> work, work a lot, the estimated cost jumps very quickly. And then I sent this message to my co-founder and CTO. His name is Ran. This is in Hebrew, but it says, "Is this for real?" It says like our estimated cost like twelve thousand dollars, and you know we are a startup. It's, it's not in our budget. It's uh, it was not something we really wanted, and <laughs> I actually couldn't believe. I thought we have a bug in our own system, and then he told me, "Yes, this is real. We need to do some, something about it." And well, eventually the the problem was uh, much bigger than we thought. It's, it wasn't like a bug. It was an architectural problem. So. What happened eventually is that since these functions were running in parallel in very high concurrency, at some point we started to monitor too many functions. And then each one of them were writing to the database uh, independently. But this database is, you know, he doesn't know. <laughs> For him, it's like uh, the world is simple. He gets the right operations and tries to do them, but eventually it choked. It just cannot handle this many right operations. And another fun thing about the Lambda functions is that they get a timeout after some time. So after five minutes, each one of them would uh, die by AWS, and then it started again. And then also the results were wrong because it couldn't finish the operation. So each one of them was running for five minutes over and over again for like eternity. And this is obviously not a good uh, <laughs> behavior. So we saw, said that, okay, we need to change something to redesign the system. And eventually, the solution that we did was, uh, let's say, okay, instead of like passively scanning it, why not let the customer's account send the information to us to a service that is actually scalable, such as Kinesis, and then have some other function analyze the data and eventually write it in bulks, not just write it together all the time, but actually aggregate, aggregate it, write it in bulks to something like Redshift, which is a service which is much more uh, suitable for these cases. And this time it works. I mean, it still works. And we don't pay, but we do pay a lot for AWS, but not, not this much. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Well, we have a, a, a late breaking change. Uh, someone from Super Evil Megacorp has forced their way onto the stage. Uh, please welcome Michael Wolf. Hey guys, uh, I I'll make this pretty quick. Um, sorry about that. Um, so uh, my name is Michael Wolf. I'm a platform engineer at Super Evil Megacorp. Uh, yes, yes, it's actually called that. And uh, we have a lair in San Mateo. Uh, we are a video game company. Uh, we are a globally scaled uh, mobile competitive uh, game. Uh, you learn a lot doing this. Um, so essentially, uh, my position is to do pretty much everything on the back end. I, I write a lot of the code on the back end. I do a lot of the support. I do a lot of the infrastructure setup. Um, I also help handle our uh, blue-green deploys. Uh, so we decided to introduce these blue-green deploys to you know, make it so that we didn't have a downtime ever, because we don't want to be up at the time when, it, when our low time is, because we have players literally everywhere in the, in, the, um, in the globe. The one consequence of this is that it's really expensive. And so a lot of times, we're, we end up building our, you know, the the secondary environment, right up where the new deployment's going. And so a couple weeks back, it was my turn. I'd done this before, but can you see, or take a guess what I, I possibly did wrong? Uh, these are whitelists. Um, yes, well, I updated the wrong configuration value. <laughs> so our, our uh, service level is usually, if someone's hitting you up on Twitter, you're doing a bad job. Uh, so fortunately, I was able to uh, find that I did this before anyone could yell at me on Twitter because we had these. We have this metric called CCU, which is the number of people actively playing the game. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we started losing people really quickly. Uh, <laughs> so I hopped on and I, and I reported this change and I was like, oh, I, I was really upset that we even had the ability to take down all these people so quickly. Um, but, uh, but I learned a lot and uh, we were able to have a normal deploy that day. Uh, but the, the reason I really wanted to give this talk was that we have this metric called CCU, 
And it means a lot more than just like a squiggle on the dash. That be, it's like the heartbeat of, of our company. You can, you can essentially see when China comes online and, and they, they go up a lot quicker because they're on the same time zone, they come down. And each, each of these regions has their quirks and you learn about that and you kind of become engaged in that. So we were able to take this and turn it into metrics where we knew there would be a certain amount of change at a certain time of day. And if it was not looking correct, there was an issue. Now, the, the big update that I did recently was that we had a huge ad campaign uh, with Apple. And so I made this alert also do a uh, warning on national shift, shift up in CCU. <laughs> and so, you know, if there's a ton of people logging in, we should spin up some servers before uh, everything gets crunched again. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to share that. Uh, any thoughts? Talk to me. We're not actually that evil. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, let's have another round of applause for all of our failures. <laughs> Thank you so much.